Good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin Matt Costa. We're kicking it old school tonight with just the two of us broadcasting live on WBSM and streaming live at SpookySouthCoast.com. If you're new to the show, you can watch us in addition to hearing us. We kind of, you know, we have faces for radio, but we've created this video component because, well, why not? If anything, it keeps us slim and trim and well-groomed. No, not at all. We are terrible, terrible-looking people. The attractive person on the show, psychic medium Stephanie Burke, is out tonight. She's under the weather. Uh, so is science advisor Matt Moniz, but hopefully we can get the gang all back together next week. I say that knowing full well that it probably won't happen, that Stephanie's probably going somewhere else next week. But uh, that's all right. We'll have a lot of fun here tonight because we will be talking about the paranormal. And tonight we're going to take things a little bit differently than we have in the past. I'm excited for this because, as any of you who listen to the show know, I'm always trying to look for alternate explanations for ghostly experiences that I never take anything at face value anymore. Just saying that a ghost is the spirit of a dead person isn't enough for me anymore because I've seen and experienced things that I can't attribute to just being the ghost of a dead person. So tonight we're going to get into some of those alternate theories a little bit later on with our guest, Brandon Masulo. He is the author of the book, The Ghost Studies, New Perspectives on the Origins of Paranormal Experiences. So if you're a diehard, no pun intended, believer in the ghosts are the spirits of dead people, that they are disembodied souls, that, you know, they may be uh, spirits that are trapped on our plane of existence, if, if that is your go-to explanation and the only explanation you'll be willing to accept, well, hopefully we can make you feel a little bit differently tonight because we're going to explore some of those alternate theories. And I'm excited for it, not only because that's where my research has led me, but I'm also excited about it because Brandon has lots of experiences from other people that he's collected over the years that will back up some of these ideas. There's a feeling, a thought, a an emotional response associated with having these experiences that I think just goes beyond the simple explanation that we've tried to rely on for the past couple of thousand years. So we'll get into all of that and more. And what I like about him too, as well, if, if you've read the ghost studies and I've, I've, I've made my way through a good portion of it, you realize that Brandon being a clinical therapist, as well as a parapsychologist, he doesn't shy away from allowing that and to get into some of his research. So that should be, we'll say controversial with some of our audience. Yeah, that maybe it is all in your head, but that's a good thing. See, people don't understand that. When, when I say to them, a lot of these paranormal experiences that were happening might just be in our own heads, they get all upset. They think I'm calling them crazy, but that's not it at all. I've said it before and I, I'll say it again. I would much rather think that I can cause this type of phenomena with my own mind, that I can use my own brain to move items across the room or, or make a door slam or, or create a voice out of thin air. I'd much rather think it's me doing that and having that ability than to think my dead grandmother can wash me in the shower. And that's just the way that I've felt about it for years. So we'll talk about that coming up a little bit later with Brandon Masulo. And we'll take your calls throughout the show, 508-996-0500, 877-996-1420. Getting a lot of positive response to last week's show with Tom Reed, where we talked about the UFO monument park that's being, uh, I, I guess, the only way we can put it is, you know, it's, it's having the clamps put on it uh, by a town in Massachusetts, uh, Hadley, Massachusetts. And we're... we're we're going to keep following up on that story. We're going to keep seeing if we can't, I guess, have some kind of influence on what's going on. I don't want to overplay our, our importance and, and say that you know we can make a difference, but I do think that the audience for this show is, is smart and sophisticated and can make their voices heard. So I, I think that we can have some kind of influence in what goes on there with that park. But if you missed last week's show, uh, definitely check it out because I think you will... I think you will enjoy it. 
I think you will enjoy the discussion, learning about Tom's experiences, but also learning about what it's like trying to, you know, they say you can't fight City Hall, but that's exactly what Tom's trying to do. So check that out. It's at SpookySouthCoast.com. The podcast is uploaded to wherever you get podcasts, uh, anywhere that you can find a podcast of a show, you will find us there. And if not, let us know and we'll make sure we add it there. But we've been doing this for a long time. 12 years of doing this show. Pretty much all the podcast aggregators have figured out where to find us by now. And then there's another bit of news that I want to share. If you hadn't heard this week, we lost another person in the paranormal world. It seems like we, we've done a lot of memorial shows over the last year. I think it was just about this time last year that our Gary Patterson passed away. And it's been like a punch in the gut, just one after the other after that. So many of my personal heroes and, and people that I was proud to hopefully eventually call friends, hopefully they felt the same way as well. But we lost our Gary Patterson. We lost Jim Mars. We've lost Art Bell. And now this past week, we lost Brad Steiger. And Matt, we had just been talking a, a few weeks ago as we were trying to revisit some of the early guests that we had on in the early years of the show, we had talked about bringing Brad back onto the program. And, and I had been hearing that he'd been under the weather and he hadn't been doing a lot of interviews in, in recent years. But yeah, right. I mean, um, I don't think I, I heard any um, that I, ne I never heard anything that uh, he was under the weather or I mean, I don't know if they were too vocal on social media, but um, it was kind of a shock to me. Yeah. I mean, I found out about it by, uh, from Jeff Belanger, so uh, I don't think anybody really made any kind of big announcement, but <clears throat> it's a shame because we really didn't get the chance to kind of revisit it. And, and, and I felt like I felt like I kind of dropped the ball on that interview because it was so long ago. I was listening to bits and pieces of it this week, kind of just remembering Brad. And it was the early days of the show, and I just kind of started out in, in being a host on my own, and, and I, I know that I wasn't fantastic but i try to at least ask the right questions and as i'm listening to it i'm going back and saying oh you missed a good chance there oh why didn't you ask this so i'm just sad that we'll never get the chance to uh, to ask some of those questions again uh but uh you know rest in peace brad steiger a huge huge influence on on this show a huge influence in the work that we do and uh, and certainly one of those names that people that are in the know know about him but it's just a shame that he didn't get as much mainstream exposure as uh, as some other folks you know he's a guy that had been in this for just as long as a hans holzer and he was chronicling things kind of from a different perspective you know he was he was a, a folklorist at heart and he was somebody who was looking at these as as a story as much as it was an experience and i feel like that was setting the tone for what a lot of this world of the paranormal has become. We've gone through our phase, and I'll call it a phase, but we've gone through our phase over the last decade plus where everything started to become about proof, 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 proof. What can we do to prove it? How can we prove to people that, that ghosts are real? How can we prove to people that UFOs actually come and visit us from other planets? How can we prove that people are getting abducted by aliens? We've gotten away from that need for proof and said, you know what, maybe we need to just take a step back and appreciate the experience and appreciate the people who are having the experiences as well. That's the other problem. The, the other part that's lost in all that is that by looking for the proof, you're discounting the experience that that person has had. You're discounting something that could have changed their entire life. We've had people that have reached out to us and said, you know, I've had this experience. It really shook me to my core. Can you come to my house and, and kind of explain to me what's going on? And you get there and, and you want to try to find uh, an, expl an explanation for it that's, you know, mundane. You want to try to find something that's, that's non-paranormal. And when you do, it's almost like you broke their heart. And I'm not talking about the crazy people that just want attention or the people that are just hoping they can get on their favorite ghost hunting TV show. I'm talking about people who were generally shook and shaken uh, by the experience and think that it 
should have, and it does have, so much more meaning than it turns out to actually have. And that's what I think Brad never lost sight of. He never lost sight of the fact that when these weird things happened, when these weird experiences, when these weird phenomena took place, it has a direct impact on the person that's experiencing it. And we can sit here and we can throw open the phone lines every Saturday night and we can listen to people tell story after story after story. And we can sit here and say, we can armchair quarterback it and say, well, did you check this? Have you checked that? Are you sure it isn't this? And we could completely break down their experience without ever having to step foot in their house and, and investigate for ourselves. And we can break it all down into possible mundane explanations. But if we do that, aren't we really killing the whole reason the whole hope, the whole belief that made them tune into this show in the first place. That doesn't mean that we have to accept everything that comes our way as being quote unquote paranormal. But we do have to consider that it's about more than just the experience. It's about how that experience shapes somebody. So we'll definitely be talking about that tonight with Brandon Masulo. And if you want to check out his website during the course of the program, it's hauntedtheories.com. And that's what I like about it right from the start. Theories. He's just putting out theories. He's not saying anything is definitely this or definitely that because he knows that A, you really can't, and B, it would almost it would almost cheapen the experience. It would almost cheapen what has happened to people to try to define it so easily. So we'll talk to him in, in just a bit. Hauntedtheories.com is his website. If you go to the website, and we'll definitely talk to him about this, the first article that you'll see on the website is his review of Ghost Stalkers, which is the show that I started working on. That's how I started working in television. So he has a, a it's a very, you know, it's a down the middle review, but we'll talk to him about that because I think that that's, I call, he mentions in the review that it's a lot of paranormal investigators' favorite paranormal shows, and, and that's something that I found over the years to be true, too. But it was supposed to be so much more than it turned out to be. So in a way, I'm also going to apologize uh, to Brandon as well for that. And again, if at any point you guys want to call in with a question or a thought uh, for our guest or in general, 508-996-0500. 877-996-1420. And of course, the chat room is open. We have a full house in there again tonight. Hello to all the bell gabbers who have joined us once again. And uh, Matt, have you noticed that the the chat room has taken some odd twists and turns over the past couple of weeks? It's uh, definitely taken a life of its own the past couple of weeks. I mean, we've had some odd conversations taking place in there as well. But it's 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 certainly getting weird. It's weirder. interesting. I yeah, love it. I like it. And that's why I'm glad that we can go back and look at it later because there's a lot of stuff I'm going to miss during the course of the conversation that I want to be able to go back and and read later on. But, of course, for those of you who are into paranormal radio, this was a, a very big week. We had the new host of Midnight in the Desert revealed – uh, earlier this week on, on Monday night, and it's Dave Schrader. Congratulations to Dave Schrader for stepping into big shoes and having to follow Art Bell. I mean, there was some time in between there that, you know, we're just not addressing right now. But uh, he's stepping into big shoes, but also he'll take those shoes and he'll walk in his own path with them. So I think people that uh, enjoy that program on the Dark Matter Digital Network, where you can hear this show every week, I think the people are going to enjoy that ride with Dave, who is a, a consummate professional as a radio host. And that show will benefit greatly from not only that, but from the fact that, you know, like our guest tonight, Dave is somebody that doesn't take things at face value and is willing to explore alternate theories and alternate ideas. And that's how we grow as people. doesn't matter if you believe in any of this stuff that we talk about doesn't matter if you believe in ghosts one bit. If you can listen to a show and hear the stories and the theories and the experiences that are being presented and walk away from it saying, you know what? 
I don't really believe in that stuff, but he makes a good point. Maybe that just opens your mind up about other things. So uh, we'll we'll certainly be talking about that uh, with our guest, Brandon Masulo. And I'm going to have Matt get him on the phone. Uh, I gave you the, the paperwork that has... Okay, so he's going to uh, get him on the phone for us. And again, 508-996-0500, if at any point you guys want to jump into the conversation as well. I think it's going to go down all kinds of interesting paths tonight. This is the kind of guest that I've wanted to have on for a long time. Somebody who's willing to say that there's got to be more than one explanation for what's happening. There's got to be at least more than one path to research to try to figure it out. And I'm going to keep uh, keep an eye on the chat room as well. Normally, Stephanie would be here uh, keeping an eye on the chat room and, and Moniz is pinch hit when she's not around. But uh, tonight I have it open to my right and I can see a little bit of it. And I can see some of it here and there. I am battling a little bit of, uh, I guess, allergies. If it's that time of year, I don't know. But I've got a little bit of a, a tickle in my throat. Have at it with the comments based on that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I may be stopping uh, to take a drink of water every now and then. But we'll soldier on because that's what you do when you want to talk about such topics. You just keep going. You don't stop. So uh, we will certainly do that. I also want to let you know, too, as well, that uh, if you go to our website, SpookySouthCoast.com, I'm just going to throw out some some quick plugs real fast. Uh, we do have some events that are coming up that we are promoting uh, on the site, some Spooky South Coast events. At uh, We have our upcoming uh, event at the Smith-Harris House in Niantic, Connecticut, we have Weird Winchenden in Winchenden, Massachusetts. We have Ghosts of the Gateway in Wareham, Massachusetts. And we have the Exoneration in North Andover, Massachusetts. So those are all up on SpookySouthCoast.com if you want to check it out. Not up on SpookySouthCoast.com. And I, I'm going to explain just real fast why we haven't put it up there on the website yet. We do have the Wicked Waters Cruise available for anybody that wants to go on a cruise with myself and, and Stephanie and, and Porter from Haunted Towns. If you want to go on that cruise... Now is the time to make your reservation because they extended the ability to just put $50 down and then have until next January to pay off the remaining balance. So it's supposed to go up to $100 for a deposit. But as of right now, you can still put a deposit down for just $50. But you have to use a promo code. So you can use my promo code, Tim, or you can use Stephanie's promo code, Burke. So I haven't put it up on the website because... That's basically asking our audience to, to choose sides. Like, do you want to use Stephanie's promo code or do you want to use my promo code? So I haven't put it up there yet, but it will go up there and you will have to choose sides, I guess. But if you just go to wickedwaterscruise.com, you can put whoever's promo code you choose in the box, but you really should put Tim because it's only three letters. It's, it's easier to spell than Burke. That has what? Five, five letters. So that's two more letters that you have to type. You don't have that kind of time. No, I'm just kidding. Put in whichever promo code you want. Uh, either way, whichever one you choose, you'll only have to put $50 down to reserve your spot. Wickedwaterscruise.com. But hurry up and act on that because the deposit price will be going up very soon. Okay, that's the plug portion of the show. Now we're going to move into the actual discussion with our guest, Brandon Masulo. He's a clinical therapist, a parapsychologist, and an author residing in Northeast Ohio. Fascinated by paranormal phenomena for more than 20 years, Brandon has been a participant in and featured speaker at numerous paranormal forums and events. He studied psychology and parapsychology at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and his research has been cited in numerous parapsychological journals, articles, and mainstream books. He's joining us tonight to talk about his book, The Ghost Studies, New Perspectives on the Origins of Paranormal Experiences. And we welcome him to the show now. Uh, good evening, Brandon. Are you with us? Yeah. Hi, Tim. Hey, there you are. Yep. And uh, here, here I am. We're so glad you could join us. Uh, and I'm sorry for the, the short notice, but I was just scanning through uh you know the internet looking for some alternate ghost theories this week and and i found your site and i i saw the book and i thumbed through a little bit of the uh, online sample and i said this is this is the guy this is who i've been wanting to talk to without even realizing it for for a long time now well i'm glad you found me 
Well, thank, thank you for joining us. And of course, I go to your website, uh, of course, uh, Haunted Theories. Uh, dot com, and as soon as I go there, what do I see but a review of Ghost Stalkers? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't that bad. You were not stuff. at all. No, not at all. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, as soon as I saw that, and I, and I read the perspective that you took into it, I said, ah, this this guy's got it. He understands. He knows what it's all about. So, uh, I, But I, I do feel the need every time I see somebody that talks about, you know, mentions how much we talked about portals and demons and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> I feel the need to say... That was the network. That was not our intention. Was it? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Now, they... You know, since I since I put that article up, I've actually had a a couple um, social media conversations with John Tenney as well, and um, you know he's a you know I knew he was an intelligent guy, but sometimes when you talk to him just one on one, you you realize how intelligent he is. Oh right. It, yeah, in... he broke things down for me. Um, but he didn't put me in my place, but he gave me a different perspective on how the whole show and how all that stuff works. And what's great about him is he'll, you know, he'll never say that you aren't entitled to your opinion. And uh, he'll probably agree with you on a lot of the criticisms that you have. And that's what I like about him is he's he's like yourself, uh, an analytical thinker at all of this. He's not somebody who just regurgitates things that other people have been saying for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of ghost research. He's looking for his own answers. And uh, that's why. I'm kind of sorry that we didn't get a chance to go down that path enough with what we were doing on on that TV show. Yeah, I and, and I know not everyone read the article, but I, it was towards the end. The last two episodes were really getting interesting. Um, the, the beginning part was a lot about portals and portals and portals, um, but the last two episodes were getting into some human dynamic stuff, consciousness. So it was really going towards a place that I was really interested in, and I guess I'm kind of sad it got canceled, but. You know, it is what it is. We've, we've toyed with the idea of bringing it back in, in some fashion, especially where uh, uh, now uh, Nick Groff, who is the producer of that show, has the haunted space. And he has his own online, basically, network. So we've toyed with the idea of maybe doing some, some specials. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then we, can, then we don't have to put in the, the P word or the D word because then we control the content. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I would stay away from portals and vortexes all that other stuff well the funny thing is though is it's 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 valid to mention it it's valid to talk about it as a possibility i think and and a lot of the things that we experience uh you know especially you know we live in an area that's called the bridgewater triangle where there's a high level of high strangeness so it's worth discussing the possibility that there might be a lot of different phenomena that are tied together somehow but to just have to keep hammering it home to the point where the viewers have turned it into a drinking game is just a little overkill yeah 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 um uh, it was, I think they mentioned portals or vortexes 55 times in 44 minutes. I think that's what I counted when I did my stats <laughs> on the show. I'm glad I didn't play yeah. the drinking game then. No, no, gosh. I'd still be drunk if I played that. So, but uh, obviously, you know, you're somebody who comes into this from a background of uh, academia. You know, you've you've studied this from a perspective that I think a lot of people don't. We have what what I like to call... You know, the, the social media researchers these days where people saw a television show, uh, formed a group, started a website, got a bunch of T-shirts that matched and started going out there and, and thinking that they had the ability to help people. But you're somebody that has studied and been trained in and spent your career helping people. So my first question to you is, and this might even be a loaded one right out of the gate, but... With people doing this research the way that they do and, and attempting to help people, are they doing good or are they doing harm? Well, I, I guess it, it, that's a really tough one to answer because I think it can go both ways. Um, you know, I think when people have ghostly encounters um, that are, are, for the most part, for people, pretty terrifying, it's nice to be able to reach out and have support from other people um, and just some sort of like, uh, almost like a support group, something, someone to talk about, someone to vent. So you know, sometimes if you just tell your your friends or your coworkers, they're gonna they might look at you like you're crazy. But having someone to reach out to and do that is is a positive thing. I, I will say because I work in the mental health field that you know if if you get a call from somebody who wants you to come out and investigate their house, you know, you don't know what you're getting into. Um, you could have someone who. Uh, could have some sort of uh, mental health issue like delusions 
and you could be feeding into those delusions. And in other words, if you come in with your equipment and say, yeah, there's demons and ghosts here, then the person who has this mental issue could, like, well, look, you know, this, there's actually demons and stuff in my house. I, I'm right. This, you know, the psychiatrist and all these people are wrong. I'll stop taking my meds. And then you could feed into delusions like that, and that could really hurt a person. Um, so, I, you know, I'm kind of on the fence. I, I do like how um, it shifted away from going into people's homes and doing these investigations, and it's kind of gone towards going to public haunted houses, like right. prisons and things like that. Which I feel, I feel a little better now. about, yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't... It's, it's, I think it's better, and, and it, it, you don't want to go in. It, I would be nervous to go into people's houses because you're dealing with so many variables when you do that. Mm-hmm. That's that's been my thing for a long time. I will get people that will send me uh, private cases that they want me to check out, and I, you know, I will if it's somebody that I know and I trust and I know them already. But generally, I have no interest in going into a stranger's home. I don't even like to go like I don't like it when I go to a yard sale. I'm a big yard sale guy. I don't like it when I go into their yard sale and they're like, "Oh, there's more stuff in the basement. There's more stuff in the garage." I'm like, "No, no, I'm good in the driveway. Thank you." Yeah, yeah, let's stay out here. Exactly. Yeah, and it's it's just there's too much going on, and and I think for someone who's not really, you know, trained in how to manage uh, crisis if it happens, you could be really out of out of your league in a way. The other thing too is uh, a lot. You know, you'd mentioned that you don't understand, you don't know what uh, issues people may have when you're going into their home. I don't. We've tried for years, and especially in the early days of doing this show, for there to be kind of a standardized list of questions that an investigator should ask a homeowner if they are going to go into their home, or you know, just anybody that they're getting involved in researching their case. Uh, and it's for more than ju- you know, if it's for helping them as opposed to just going out and having your own experiences. And one of the things that we've always pushed for is that you should ask what type of medications that people are on, and don't be afraid if you go into their home. It's almost like it's not an invasion of privacy to open their medicine cabinet if they're putting you into this position to help them out because you need to know these things. And so as much as you want to walk around with your Hans Holzer book and your, you know, picture yourself ghost hunting and all these other research manuals that you may have for what it is that you're doing out in the field, you should also have the big book of pills as part of your right. research. And you should know what it is that people are taking and how it could be affecting their lives and, and maybe causing some of these manifestations. Yeah, yeah. I think that those are legitimate questions to ask. Um, but, you know, sometimes people just might not answer or they might not tell you the truth. You know, that, that's the other thing. Right. you got to trust the person. Um, but, you know, I, I have seen cases where, you know, um, these people have gone into the house and things have actually worked out to the positive. You know, like they found, um, you know, overwhelming electromagnetic fields or, you know, some sort of abnormality that could cause long-term health effects. Um, so I've seen positives come out of the situation as well. Because I think even if you have a, a caseworker or, um, you know, a professional go into the house, you know, they're, they're looking at certain things when they ask their questions. They're not looking at the environment and how that can affect the person. Mm-hmm. Sometimes these paranormal investigators are actually looking at the environment and taking readings and, um, you know, they can find these high EMF levels and fluctuations and you know, the homeowner can get that addressed and then things might go pretty well after that. I mean, there was a a case that my my co-host, Matt Moniz, who's uh, normally here, but he's he's under the weather tonight, uh, he got a call for a case and he he called me and he said, you know, listen, I know that you've never gone on a quote-unquote demonic case. uh, And he's using that term as the way that the person is describing it, not the way he would. Uh, But he's saying, I know you've never gone on to one of these cases before and, and I think that this might be a good chance for you to kind of get your feet wet on it. And so we were looking into it and then a couple of weeks go by and, you know, he's, he's meeting with the people, he's looking into the case and he calls me up and he says, listen, we're not going to be doing that case. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong there. There's just some bad, bad stuff going on with this family and they're looking for a scapegoat for what they have as their own problems. And I, and that's the problem I think that a lot of, uh, uh, you know, these, weekend ghost hunters have is that they're just so excited to get the, the case and to, to have the opportunity to, to help and to do the research that they're not realizing that sometimes you're just a tool in somebody else's dysfunction. Yeah. Yeah. They're looking to, to blame it on you or externalize their problems onto something that's not there. 
it's not my fault that my I have erratic mood swings and I punch walls and I have anger issues. It's the, the ghost's fault, the demon's fault, something like that. Sorry, I'm just. Uh, I'm, I, you think I'd be better at working in radio at taking direction silently? But uh, Matt was telling me to up the audio a little bit. How's that, Matt? Is that what you're looking for? Good. Okay. Uh, it's a. Uh, you know, normally I'm just normally I'm on top of things, but I'm just getting into the conversation so much here that uh, that you know it's affecting my ability to produce. So. <laughs> but you got uh, you, you got a lot of responsibilities then producing, interviewing the whole nine yards. Well, I just make it look good because I'm the only one on camera. You don't see the guy that's behind the scenes doing all the work. <laughs> that's, right. that's how it works best. But I, I find it interesting that you studied at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland because Europeans have a very different approach to a lot of this stuff than, than Americans do. It's it's almost like, uh, I don't want to say that it's more accepted necessarily, but at least it's not as taboo as it was for here for so long. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I would go with accepted. I think academia accepts it, accepts it more um in the UK than, than probably anywhere else, because there's a lot of universities that have programs with um, that do parapsychological research. Uh, and in the, in the States, we really don't have anything like that. Uh, I think it's uh, the University of Virginia has a department, and I think there's one other one I can't recall off the top of my head. Um, but, but nothing as, or it's not as widespread as it is in Europe. And I, and I think that, that that sort of translates into the society as a whole, um, because over there in Europe, they could have uh, a lot more research, a lot more uh, academia-oriented stuff on ghosts and paranormal and ESP and psi, uh, and, it's, and it could be more accepted, whereas here, we don't really have a lot of, you know, researchers working on something like that. I mean, Dean Radin does a great job, um, and there's, a, there's definitely a handful of others, but not as widespread as it is in Europe. And, and just in Europe, I mean, if you go to Scotland, anytime you walk down the street, everybody wants to tell you a ghost story. Every pub has a ghost. Every, uh, you know what I'm saying, every building does that. Uh, so they're open about their beliefs. And here, you know, you really have to pry into a person sometimes to get whether they believe in ghosts or not. So it's just like a, di it's a different environment, different atmosphere, um, different societal views of ghosts. And for people who aren't familiar, what is the process of studying parapsychology, and, and how does that differ from studying psychology itself? Um, well, I mean, parapsychology is, is the, the branch of, it's a, a subset of psychology or a branch of psychology. And with parapsychology, what you're really studying is um, what they call psi. And that's, you know, your remote viewing, your extrasensory perception, your telepathy, your remote viewing, um, psychokinesis, uh, reincarnation, and obviously the survival hypothesis, which is ghosts. And it's, it's a study, it's basically a study of all the paranormal phenomena that's out there. Um, so when you, when, you study psych, when you study parapsychology, you actually get your base in psychology, and then you get like a specialization in parapsychology. When it comes to learning about parapsychology, the, the one thing that they stress the most at least at the University of Edinburgh, was uh, psychological research methods. So my degree is actually in psychological research methods with a specialization in parapsychology, which means my dissertation um, and my research was done in a, you know, on a parapsychological topic. So what you do is you really get a lot, a lot of courses on, you know, how to develop experiments, um, y you know, the scientific method, um, statistics, uh, sort of all those types of things, and then you get um, classes then in parapsychology, like the history, um, research in parapsychology, and then you obviously do your in, your dissertation on it. So what you do is you get um, that base in statistics and research, uh, and then a few classes on actually what parapsychology is. So it's not like you walk in there and you're hanging out in seances and hanging out with psychics or anything like that. It's a strong research education. It's, it's kind of what you do when you study parapsychology. And then you, you pick something that, you know, that interests you. Uh, and, and for me, it was survival hypothesis or ghosts. And, and what, exa what exactly is survival hypothesis? Um, well, it's, it's basically the idea that, you know, some, some part of us um, 
whether that's consciousness, a spirit, uh, our personality, uh, our soul, um, continues to exist after we die. So typical neuropsychology would say we're, we're like machines. Um, we're a combination of circuits and electricity. And then obviously once the, the circuits and electricity stop working, the machine stops working and we cease to exist in any sort of plane, whether that's consciousness or soul or anything like that. Um, the survival hypothesis is in, contradicts that and says some part of us lives after that. So ghosts obviously would mean some part of us, whether that's soul, spirit, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, lives on after we die. That's basically the survival hypothesis. And I and I feel like that is a you know it's a huge part of of the research and a huge part of what. The, ev- well, the data that we've collected has showed us, I almost use the word evidence, but the data that we've collected has showed us is that there is some sort of a, a retention of that. But, you know, being a psychologist, too, you have to understand that a lot of that could also be that it comes from our own ego and our own um, just the way that we put ourselves atop the, the, the level of importance in this world and the way that we put ourselves in a position where we think that we deserve to have life after the physical and that we think that we should have more of a something uh, beyond this. And and so part of it, I think, is comes from our own almost misguided sense of self as well. But that misguided sense of self could also be what's leading to these ghosts existing. We, we could just have these consciousness continue because we think that they should. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, it's 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 sad to think that my memories, my personality, who I am as a person just stops when I pass on. You know, it's, it's sad, uh, and, and it's depressing in a way. Um, so, you know, if given the choice, you want to say, yes, there is an afterlife. There is something that happens after we cease to exist. Uh, and all the, all the, the data that you collect, the, the, these near-death experiences that people have when they die and they, they sort of, um, have these out-of-body experiences where they they see the surgeon and they float to another room and they say who's who's above them in the hospital. This this kind of gives some idea that what's going on there. Like if consciousness is somehow leaving the body, um, and if consciousness could leave the body, you know how long is it outside the body? And you know so all these questions really come back to this idea of what happens after we die or afterlife or survival hypothesis. So I think as, as humans, you know, we want, I, I know I, I would like that to think that that happens out in, after we die, not only for me, but for pets and everything else like that. So maybe that passion uh, is something that's, that's related to, you know, actually the afterlife. Um, but, you know, I think there is a lot of data. There's, there's a lot of ghostly encounters out there mm-hmm. that there's millions and millions and millions of them. And, you know, you could chalk up. I don't know how many to fraud, maybe 10% to fraud and, you know, 20% to misinterpreting things. Or, you know, I can keep going with the percentages, but I think there's a lot of them out there that are pretty good solid evidence that something is happening after we die. And you do talk a lot in the in the book about how it's hard to, to express this to people who have never experienced it because it's not something that's easily repeatable, that you have to have the experience kind of in the moment to, to really understand it. And I think that if you look at the people who go into this field, the people who go into doing this research or the people who are just hobbyists that want to go and buy a ticket to a, to a ghost hunt, wh- whichever path you're taking, you're putting yourself in a position where you can have these experiences on a repeated basis. You are having them on a repeated basis and you will experience these things because it is out there, but that is a catch 22 because as you put yourself into those experiences where you can actually experience them, then comes the expectation of having that experience. So how do you differentiate as, as a psychologist between, you know, uh, something that is uh, an actual event and something that was just somebody anticipating an event and, and maybe overthinking it? So, so that's the actual, that's the million dollar question. You know, um, how do you validate an experience? Um, when we think about things, we think parapsychology is completely different than psychology. You know, this idea that uh, love and, and um, happiness 
and depression and sadness. Um, these are concrete, real things. But and but you know, a person's personal encounters with ghosts are not concrete, real things. But the idea is they're kind of the same. They're both subjective experiences that people report. Anytime you read a research article in psychology or counseling, I shouldn't say anytime, a fair majority of the time it's based on questionnaires. And questionnaires are just subjective, subjective perspectives. People fill out a questionnaire. Um, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how depressed are you? 10. Uh, then you do the therapy, and then they ask on a scale of 1 to 10, four weeks after you do the therapy, how do you feel? And then you circle a 3. Well, his depression went down. So the research and the statistics that they're drawing from those types of research articles is all subjective. It's a subjective experience. Um, there's no test to determine if their depression went down as far as blood tests, urine tests, anything like that. So a lot of the research out there, and this, this is for psychology, but this can span different areas. Um, anytime you're doing, dealing with humans, you're dealing with subjective perspectives and experiences, aside from doing neuro testing and things like that. So, you know, I think our subjective experiences, you know, we, we have to, as a society, we have to believe people sometimes when we do research. And the same with ghostly encounters. You know, you, you have a person, you can maybe rule out some things, you know, um, if, if you have two people witnessing uh, the same thing, you could probably rule out some type of hallucination, mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's things you can do to rule stuff out, but you can never 100% know that this person had an actual genuine experience. I just think in technology right now, we're not at that point. Um, you know, maybe in the future, I, I always say this because people ask me, you know, what's it going to look like in 20, 30 years? Are we still going to be having no answers to all these questions? And I think, I think that um, things are getting better as far as paranormal experiences and parapsychology and validating some of these experiences. But as technology gets better, I think, Craig, I mean, we, hold, we carry our phones around with us now and we can determine our blood pressure and all this other stuff. I think maybe in 30 years we might be having our phones with us 24-7, so when someone actually has a spontaneous paranormal experience, something could happen on the phone. They could record the person's EEG or heart rate or... Um, some neuro stuff, and then you could sort of uh, correlate those experiences with true, or those that data with true experiences, and then you're going to get more consistency, and the variables are going to get smaller and smaller, and then you can actually have some sort of consistent data to correlate with a paranormal experience. Well, I definitely want to get into it more in, in the second hour when we can really get into some of these uh, topics in depth. But, you know, you mentioned something that has been a, a pet theory of mine and something that I've said for years is that we're trying to apply the laws of physics in trying to find proof. We're trying to apply the laws of physics into something that is probably not physical to begin with. I, I, like you, you mentioned in the book, that these interactions are something that is emotional. And I think that that's what a ghost is. It's an emotion. In the same way you can't measure love or measure fear, but you can kind of pick up on some environmental impacts that those emotions have, but you will never actually be able to quantify them directly. And I think that's, that's, that's what we're dealing with with ghosts, and it seems like you, you feel the same way. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I, I think emotions do play a huge part in, in paranormal experiences. And, um, you know, it, it, I mean, the, overall, the paranormal is, is an overall difficult area to study, mm -hmm. right? Because you can't do it in a logical, scientific way, in a way. Because these experiences are erratic, they're episodic, they're poorly documented, they're random, they're not repeatable at will. So uh, this is everything the scientific method hates. Um, so we have to be a little, we have to think outside the box, we have to get nonlinear with some things. Um, and... And we have to really take into account emotions because it's the one thing that you usually see a lot of times when it comes to these paranormal experiences. There's usually some type of heightened emotion that's going on. And it seems like as the experiences is happening, the experience that takes place, the emotion in the room obviously becomes more charged and that's feeding into the activity even more. So when I see it all the time when we do, you know, our, our paranormal ghost events that we do as fundraisers for historic haunted places. We bring people into a room. 
or we have people in different rooms, something starts happening, everybody comes running into that room to see what's going on, the activity gets really charged up, and then after a few minutes, it starts to dissipate again. And he would say, well, why is it dissipating if you have all these people in there and all this energy that it can draw from? Why does it go away so easily? And I think it goes away because people are just becoming more acclimated to the experience, and it's no longer as as strange and unusual, and so that's kind of depowering it a little bit. Perspective. Well, you also mentioned too, and uh, we, we've only got about three minutes before the, the we have to take a break for the news. But uh, you you know you mentioned that you feel a person has to be there to perceive it for it to happen. And oh I've, yeah yeah yeah, the, I agree. That's the only constant for the last million years or so with ghostly encounters, a person has to be there to see it, experience it, feel it, whatever. So people are really the only constant when it comes to these experiences. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And then the skeptical person says, well, what about all the uh, security camera footage? We, you know, we just put up on our YouTube channel security footage somebody gave us this week of a very interesting encounter. So people say, what about security footage? It's, but it's, it, there's a philosophical expectation to that, that when that footage is recorded, it will be seen by a human eye at some point. So you still have the, yeah. the phenomena happening for a human perception. It just might not be immediate. Yeah, 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 and you just, you don't know if there's a person in the house, or, yeah, there's so much, and with video nowadays, I think it's, it's, people just debunk the heck out of all that stuff, because all the things you can do with your computer, and all the illusions you can make, it's, it's tough to really get a piece of video that's 100%. And that's why I gave up on trying to come up with the, you know, the, the piece of video or the photo or the, the audio clip or whatever it would be that would prove to a skeptic that this stuff is real. And I said, you know, it doesn't matter what I get. The important part is that I take you somewhere and you can have the experience for yourself. That's the only way you're going to realize that this stuff is legitimate. Yeah, yeah, I, I, would, pro I would agree with that. And uh, coming up in the next hour, I, I do want to get kind of more deeper into this. I want to talk about, you know, your idea of, of what ingredients are necessary to have an experience. We can explore that a little bit more and talk about some of these different theories uh, that people have about what ghosts could be. And, of course, we welcome phone calls as well, 508-996-0500, 877-996-1420. As well, if you want to call in toll-free, but it's 2018. Come on, we've all got cell phones. But if you need the toll-free line, we have it there for you. And, of course, the chat room at SpookySouthCoast.com. If you want to share your questions there as well, you can also tweet us at SpookySC or just use the hashtag SpookyLive and we'll see it there. So there's uh, many ways to get your questions, but of course the best way is the old-fashioned way and that's to call in and talk to us directly on the phone. And again, uh, during, the web, uh, during the break, if you want to go to Brandon's website, HauntedTheories.com, you can see some of his writing there as well. And uh, you can also pick up the book, The Ghost Studies, New Perspectives on the Origins of Paranormal Experiences. And we'll, we'll dig deep into that in the next hour. Is there uh, – you're afraid to, to go a little bit too deep tonight, Brandon, or is it all on the table? No, it's all on the table. Good. Let's get really weird coming up uh, following the news. And uh, we'll be back with more Spooky South Coast coming up. Following the news, it's a it's a brief break for those of you who are watching online. Those of you who are new to the show, last week we had a show that was on YouTube only because the Red Sox were on our radio station. But when we are on the radio itself, we do have to take a break for the news. It also will give me a chance to go get a cup of tea and see if I can calm these coughs down a little bit. Uh, so we will run some music for you during the break on the video stream. If you are listening on the radio, throw us up on YouTube. Watch us on your smart TV. We'll be back with more Spooky South Coast in just a bit. New Bedford's News Talk Station. 1420, 1420 WBSM. New Bedford. Streaming worldwide on the WBSM app. All right, welcome back. Hour number two of Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin, Matt Costa. Just had a little bit of a production meeting there as we were coming back, because apparently it was my fault that you couldn't hear the guest. I was, I was trying to make the guest louder by turning up the volume of the phone call over the terrestrial airwaves and not over the video. So I apologize. That was my fault. We're going to have it louder for you in this hour. We'll blame Frank. <laughs> blame the engineer. Uh, so, yes, it is It is nice that we are, are on a real radio station putting on a paranormal radio show each and every week. But that also means I have real responsibilities that after 12 years of doing this show, I just haven't mastered. I'm upfront about it. 
I'm not afraid to admit my shortcomings. I'm not afraid to say I took a whole bunch of Benadryl before I came in and did this show, so now I'm all goofy. And I have no idea what I'm doing from a technical standpoint. But as long as the conversation is good, that's what I'm all about. And we are having a great conversation with our guest tonight, Brandon Masulo. If you want to check out his website, it is hauntedtheories.com. We have it linked up at SpookySouthCoast.com as well. And you can check out his book, The Ghost Studies, New Perspectives on the Origins of Paranormal Experiences. And that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about ghost studies. We're talking about different theories of ghosts and going beyond just the idea that they're the spirits of dead people. And I'm not saying that that isn't a possibility, but I just, I agree with Brandon in that a lot of the research is pointing to a lot of different possibilities. So let's bring him back up on the line and uh, we can get into those possibilities with him. Uh, Brandon, we were saying before the news break that you have your theory of necessary ingredients that have to be in play for this type of phenomena to occur. And, uh, and it seems like from, from reading the book, you know, you can attribute this theory to most of the cases that you've had reported to you. Uh, and it seems to be something that has worked out pretty well. Do you, do you feel like this is a, a, a definite for these experiences that they must have these, these three main ingredients? Um, I, I wouldn't say a definite. I, I think um, it, it's so complicated and complex with ghostly encounters that I think my my theories can account for a large number of them. But obviously, if there's stuff flying off the walls and psychokinesis and poltergeist stuff, my theories don't really touch those. Um, but in the book, I actually, like you mentioned, I I I have a two new theories that I I go over in the book extensively. Um, one of them is ghostly ingredients theory or the necessary ingredients to a ghostly encounter. And the other one is uh, spontaneous apparitional trace theory, um, which has to do with haunting specifically. The ghostly ingredients theory um, basically goes over the optimal conditions for ghostly encounters to occur. And it's, it's kind of like an equation. It's, it says that, um, you know, you have uh, psychological aspects, plus changes in internal energy or bioenergetics, plus external information uh, acquisition equals ghostly encounter. Um, so it sounds a little fancy, but what it really means is, what I really look at is these things called crisis apparitions. Um, crisis apparitions are spontaneous paranormal experiences. So these are the ones like um, where you wake up on a random Tuesday and uh, the, there's a apparition of your aunt glowing and floating above you, and then you um, she says goodbye and then she leaves, and then you find out the next day that she actually passed away at that time, uh, that the apparition occurred to you. That's what they call a crisis apparition. So I, I don't think that these crisis apparitions and, and some of these ghostly encounters are as, as simple as just waking up and witnessing them. I think there's a series of complex processes which are occurring uh, consciously as well as unconsciously, which set the stage for this sort of crisis apparition. And, you know, I talked about psychological aspects. Psychological aspects or emotions, they've always been linked with paranormal phenomenon. And this goes back to the work of the early um, SPR, Society for Psychical Research. And it goes back to Carl Jung, Eleanor Sidgwick, Louisa um, uh, Louisa Ryan, uh, they all believe that heightened emotions are necessary for paranormal phenomenon to occur. So when I say heightened emotions, usually these heightened emotions are the response of someone in crisis and trauma, acute stress, life-threatening events. What they do is, in a way, uh, they cause an explosion of emotional distress and turmoil that sort of reverberates throughout the entire body, and that affects us mentally and physically. And then these acute emotional shifts uh, are sort of the starting point or the catalyst for a ghostly phenomenon. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but, you know, humans are, in essence, a, a collection of electrical signals, um, heart, nerve, impulses, neurons, and we're electrical beings. So the, the question is, what happens to our internal electrical makeup or our bioenergetics when we experience a crisis or emotional overload? Um, what's, what's apparent is all living things, um, 
are capable of generating this electromagnetic field. And what's also apparent from the research in the book is that this bioelectrical charge created by emotion sort of adds information to our electrical field because humans all have electrical fields. And then this, kind of like all electrical fields, it's not contained in our body. And it actually goes out into the atmosphere. And I believe these two processes, these emotional, psychological aspects, changes in internal bioenergetics, lead to or sort of trigger this human ability to acquire or communicate information in the Earth's atmosphere. So what the ghost studies really suggest is that um, our minds are entangled or connected with the minds of others, both alive and deceased, and can kind of synchronize at great distances with the help of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and the information that's passed comes in visual images, feelings, hunches, visions, or voices. And, and what I do in the book is I go over crisis apparitions, um, uh, hauntings, residual cases, and I, I, I give a nice case example, and then I kind of explain a little bit about how my theory plays into that. Um, if you wanted to, I can give you a quick case example and kind sure. of explain it. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is one I have from my book. Uh, Tori had, had just settled into bed and was looking forward to a good night's sleep. She had just closed her eyes when she noticed a bright flash of light. She sat up in her bed and scanned the room. However, everything was back to blackness. She heard footsteps and smelled gasoline. She was then overwhelmed by a bright light followed by an image of her older cousin Jerry almost glowing while floating in front of her bed. She stated, he was as clear as if he was standing in front of me on a bright sunny day. Tori reported she even noticed a glare from her cousin Jerry's glasses. Jerry stared back at Tori, gave her a thumbs up signal, and then disappeared. The next morning, Tori had gotten a call from her mother stating that her cousin Jerry, the one who appeared to her, died last night in an accident while working in his garage. All right? So what we have here is sort of a typical crisis apparition. She had witnessed her cousin Jerry um, in her bedrooms. She had auditory phenomenon, uh, heard footsteps. She actually had olfactory phenomenon, which is smelling stuff. She smelled gasoline. So in this case, we have a witness who is having these auditory phenomenon, these footsteps. Um, she's having smells that shouldn't be there in her bedroom, like gasoline, or at least I hope it shouldn't be there. Um, she also has this extremely vivid, specific image of her cousin to the point where she actually notices his glasses. Um, so we have, like many cases with these crisis apparitions, we have a witness who's Tori with an emotional or familiar connection with the, the apparition, who's her cousin Jerry. She's related to him. So we have uh, also, we have Cousin Jerry, who's experiencing a distress or life-threatening situation. In essence, Jerry was dying, um, which presumably, if we're dying, it's probably going to cause a lot of emotional distress and turmoil and all that fear and regret and all that stuff. Uh, we don't know what his thoughts or emotions were, but we can sort of put ourselves in his situation. Um, it turned, uh, Jerry had actually, I think, a car fell on him, and he died. So as the car fell on him, this is sort of when he projected his telepathic message to, to Tori. Um, so his acute emotional distress as the result of his death caused internal fluctuations, which in essence sent an unconscious distress signal into the environment, and this distress signal, once in the environment, bounced around until it sort of matched frequencies or resonated with cousin Tori. And then this is what happens. We have a haunt-type phenomenon. Um, so this is sort of a ghostly encounters theory in in essence, um, it's a lot more in detail in the book, but, you know, w when we think of ghosts and apparitions, um, they're actually only a small part of paranormal phenomenon. This telepathy, this distress signals when it comes to people in danger communicating to others, this is pretty common. Uh, about 90% of the cases, 10% uh, of the cases of, are usually hauntings, but 90% that are reported usually to um, universities are about these spontaneous crisis apparitions. So in this case, we have a, a trauma happening to Jerry. He's in emotional distress, um, changes in his internal bioenergy, uh, which sort of triggers this ability to send a message to Tori, and it comes out in the form of a, a ghostly encounter. And I, I think that um, when you look at something like a crisis apparition when you look at even if you look at something as simple as when people say twins are kind of 
uh, on an, on a wavelength where one can kind of feel what the other one is feeling, or or they can have an unspoken language between them or an unspoken communication between them. It just shows that we are all connected by that energy, and it, it we know that when we need to turn it on, we can. But it would just be fascinating if we could keep it on all the time or or just reach into the bag and, and pull it out when we needed it, uh, you know, when we wanted to, as opposed to solely in these moments of crisis or moments where, uh, you know, the extreme circumstance has made that our only option. If we could kind of harness this on a regular basis, we would be expanding our existence so much more. Well, it's a it's, it's good thing you brought that up because there's kind of research into that. Um, so this idea of, um, and I'm sure you and your listeners have heard of this idea of entanglement or, or non-locality, which, which sort of describes the ability of, um, of people or objects to instantaneously know about each other's state, even when they're separated by distances. And, and, and with this entanglement or this synchronization, um, when this happens, information is sort of transported. So they did... Um, there's a lot of research out there where, you know, they'll, they'll, um, there's one example of where they put two participants, um, one in a completely black, dark room, and then another in a normal room. And what they found was that there's a rough idea of a magnetic field pattern that increases the likelihood of entanglement. And when they put this around their heads, what they did was when person A was stimulated with light flashes, all right, this is the, and then person B, this is the person who's in a pitch black room, showed a response similar to seeing light flashes. So person A gets light flashes in their eyes. Now they have these magnetic fields going around their heads, so they're synchronized or something like that. Person A gets the light flashes. Person B is in a completely dark room. He's experiencing light flashes. Why is this? So he showed a similar response to seeing light flashes. How is this possible if, if he's in a pitch black room? Well, these complex rotating magnetic fields, when applied to both, somehow synchronize their brains. Um, they actually separated participants uh, um, almost 4,000 miles apart to see if they can get entanglement, and they did. They also did studies where they took people who had psychic abilities, and um, in the studies with people with psychic abilities, both the psychics and the subjects, EEG, which is sort of measures your electrical activity in your brain, when those resonated or became similar, that's when accurate readings took place between the psychic and the subject. That's when the readings happened. That's when he gained information that he should not have known. So what we have here is this entanglement or this communication uh, with people at a distance. Uh, so th there is some research going that way, uh, which sort of points to the idea that we, we can do this with the help of the environment, with the help of um, you know, bioenergetic fluctuations and magnetic fields. It, it's possible to do, and in the book I break it down, all the research, everything that's going on, how entanglement happens, how that relates to ghosts, how that relates to haunting. I wish that my one of my usual co-hosts, Stephanie Burke, was here. She's, she's a psychic medium, and, uh, and you talk about in the book the idea that <clears throat> people are, are giving off these energies and, and kind of tapping into that. And, uh, and I wanted to pick her brain a little bit on, you know, if she thinks that it's entirely, you know, you mentioned the idea that it's in the book, that it's people that are giving off these impressions. So it's not so much that somebody might be uh, visualizing your dead grandmother appearing before them, but it's the fact that you are putting out this impression of your dead grandmother for that person to perceive. And so I kind of wanted to get her take on what she thinks about that, because that I think is... You know, that's pretty much key into a lot of these uh, hauntings that we have is, you know, we're going into a place that say we go to the Lizzie Borden house, which I go to all the time. It's 20 minutes from our studio and people are encountering the Borden spirits there all the time. That's who they're running into every time that they go there. And if the factors are there to have a particular haunting, then why wouldn't there be other spirits that are there as well? Why would it be theirs that they continuously interact with? And I think it's that same idea that it's because we, the living are projecting out those spirits because that's who we're expecting to run into there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that when you talk about the Borden house, you're talking about hauntings or 
kind of, sort of like residual things, whether it's residual or intelligent hauntings that occur. Um, and and these are those are a little bit different than like a crisis apparition. So crisis apparitions usually happen uh, one time, and the people are usually linked somehow, right? Um, like I I see a vision of my dead grandma. The reason I did that is because we're linked. In hauntings, it's it's a little bit different, but it's but you're right. It's actually kind of the same, you know. If uh, and I have a lot of these case examples in in the book, you know. If 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 I go to a haunted location, w- what I could be picking up on is this sort of telepathic distress signal that's been lingering around the house for a number of years. So if we go back to that example that I talked about, you know, Tori and cousin Jerry, you know, if 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 let's say 100 years in the future I buy Tori's house and I'm sitting in the bedroom and I see I start smelling gasoline and I start seeing images of this this guy with glasses um um kind of giving me the thumbs up sign, right? So this is 100 years in the future that after Tori and cousin Jerry had or after Tori had this crisis apparition. Now I bought her house, I'm in the in the house, I'm having um, apparitions of this guy smelling gasoline. What what I'm it's not so much the spirit of cousin Jerry that I'm picking up on, but I'm sort of resonating or picking up on this um, uh, telepathic distress signal that was sent between Tori and cousin Jerry a hundred years ago that I'm picking up on. So it's kind of like a modified version of an imprint theory or a stone tape theory. Mm-hmm. The only thing is I'm not. It's not so much the environment that I'm picking up. It's more the telepathic distress signal that was sent years ago. So in the Lizzie Borden case, you could have this communication that occurred that somehow you're picking up on 100 years in the future. It it is fascinating to me that we talk about some of these theories as being, uh, you know, new ways of thinking. And and some of them are, you know, the idea, you know, qu- quantum mechanics is something that's that's relatively new in in terms of uh, applying it to this research. But in a way, a lot of these theories were thought about, you know, 100, 150 years ago with the with the uh, SPR too. They were looking into some of these alternate possibilities. They weren't just taking everything at face value. And and so if you look at it like that, you know, a hundred years later, we're still not sure. Um, it's almost. It's almost like it's a. It's, it, it, we're putting a limitation on ourselves to be able to figure out this problem. There's something getting in the way of actually figuring out how this all happens and, and how we can continue to have it happen. Yeah. Well, w- what's amazing is the, there's, the book came out, uh, I want to say it was like 18, oh, God, I'm, I'm not going to get this right. I think it was like 1860-something. The Phantasms of the Living mm-hmm. came out, and, and that was a... 600 some cases of spontaneous case examples of ghostly encounters and in the book telepathy is a huge part of how they explain it so that happened in the 1800s um kind of got away from that for a while and and i think that you know because ghosts there there's a number of theories on them but ghosts kind of got away from that popular popularity or pop culture sort of viewed them more spirits and, and you know you have to solve the problem, and then they'll go into the light. So it kind of moved a little bit towards that, and then this whole EMF and energy thing happened. But now what we're finding is some of this stuff all is correlated, um, and now there's research out there showing that, you know, this. If we go back to the telepathy and the, the phantasms and some of the theories from the 1800s, and now we're sort of seeing somewhat science saying, um, validating some of those beliefs that happened in the 1800s. So it's really taken a huge 180, if you want to think about it like that. It, it is, uh, you know, as I look around and I, I go to these uh, events that we hold and I see people buying all the latest equipment, and, and I used to. I used to collect the different gear, and uh, now I have it just because I know people want to use it on, on the investigations. But if I'm going into a haunted place, I might bring – you know, a, a Mel meter or a K2 meter, just some sort of simple EMF detector to be able to tell if there is, you know, uh, just to kind of get baselines and to see if there's anything that might be leaking EMF or something that might be causing these issues. But generally, I'm not necessarily counting on that to be uh, proof that there's a, a spirit present anymore because I sometimes will sit at my house 
with my K2 meter and put it on the table and or put it on my desk and just sit there and, and think to myself, make the light go, make the light go, make the light go. And it might take hours and hours of it sitting there thinking about it, but after a while, I'll get a couple little blips on the uh, on the, the readout. And so I think that if you have enough people that are in a haunted place that want to have something happen, we could be the ones that are influencing this. So, you know, just the bioenergy alone, I think, can explain for a lot of this these these experiences that we have on investigations that don't go anywhere you know yeah. if, if we're not going to have a, a whole bunch of different types of activity happening and and something that could actually prove that something might be there and present if we're just getting these little fluctuations these little blips that to me proves more that we're causing it than the fact that there's some sort of outside uh thing taking place yeah and the, the whole the i think in the 70s there was the philip experiment mm -hmm. and, and the the Philip experiment was basically a bunch of people got together, I don't know, five days a week for two or three years, and essentially they they created a ghost. Um, so they became so linked or resonated that they were able to sort of manipulate the environment around them and make tables move and all kinds of stuff happen. Um, just with the ability, the human dynamics of the, the, the situation, which is kind of what you're talking about there, sort of that psychokinesis or mind moving objects type situation um so yeah you know it, there's a lot of human dynamics that happen in, in, in any anything that we do there's human dynamics involved that you know we can't really measure uh and you know a lot of these things that we have i mean the k2 meter is notoriously flawed if you want to think about it like that um it wouldn't be 35 dollars if it was really you know highly sensitive <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, if if it's not really something you an electrician probably wouldn't rely on a K two meter, right? Um, you know, there's more sophisticated things out there, um, but you know, it, I think there's a role for all these things, the EMF meters. I think there's a role that electromagnetic fields play in paranormal experiences. So, like, I I would agree with you. You know, taking these things on investigations, I think. There could be benefits to it, but you. My advice would be to make sure you uh, d don't get all your information from the TV shows, and make sure you come up with sort of your own baseline readings and standard protocol for how you use these types of things. Because um, you know, I could walk into a Lizzie Borden house cold and blind, and my meter is going to go bananas. That doesn't mean there's a ghost there. It could right. mean a numerous other things. It, it's it's so funny because people do rely on what they've seen on television to kind of direct them and how you know that's their how to manual and how to use the the equipment that they order online. They see it on Ghost Hunters, they see it on Ghost Adventures, they want it, and so they order it for themselves. They bring it home and they say, "Oh, I'm just going to use it just like, uh, you know, just like they use it on TV because they don't they don't come with an instruction manual." And so you're you're going into these haunted places and you're trying to use it the same way that you do on TV, not realizing that that presentation was created by an editor and not necessarily by the investigator. You know, that they're, when, when they, they might say, well, here's how it works. Like John Tenney, you mentioned earlier, is a perfect example. He can tell you all the pros and cons of each piece of equipment, and they're going to just take one part that he says and put that into the episode because yeah. Yeah. that helps the narrative of, of the story that they're trying to tell. So you don't get the complete cross-section of, of what's good and what's bad. So... People are running around with K2 meters thinking that every blip on the radar is, is a ghost as opposed to yeah. being, you know, just the fact that you moved it too fast. Yeah, and, that, and that's, I mean, it's sad, but it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's entertainment. And, you know, of the 10 million people who watch Ghost Adventures, you know, maybe a thousand of them are actual paranormal investigators. The rest are just people who want to be entertained. Um, so the majority wins in those types of situations. But for those people who are really interested in paranormal, you know, you could you could just easily type in, um, you know, research articles nowadays on Google Scholar, and you could pick up ways about how academia is really using EMF. Um, there's been a lot of there's a lot of research, and I mention it all in the book. I have a whole chapter on EMF research, um, and it's uh, there's people who take EMF. Uh, readings in haunted locations, and they they kind of tell you how to do it in a way. I mean, my research in, at Mary King's Close in Edinburgh, 
I use an EMF meter, um, and it's definitely how I use it is not the standard, but it, it's different than what you're going to see on TV and probably a little bit better. <laughs> so that the information is out there if people really, really, really want it. Um, but listen, I'll be honest, it's boring. Um, you know, the ghost box is cool. All those types of things are cool. Um, the research I did at Mary's Keene's Close, if you had a camera following me around, it'd be boring as all heck. That's how most investigations actually go. It's, you know, 10 seconds of excitement followed by 10 hours of nothing else yeah. happening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I do think we have a question on the line for you. And if anybody wants to call in 508-996-0500, 877-996-1420. We'll go to the phones Phone here. here. Uh, good evening. You are on Spooky South Coast with Brandon Masulo. How are you? Good evening, Tim. Good evening, Brandon. This is Mike Montana. Hello, how are you doing? And I'll take the answer off the air. I just wanted to know, I, you may have discussed this earlier, but I kind of caught the show at the last about 30 minutes after the show started. Um, my question is, what is the difference between a shadow person and a ghost? I have seen a shadow person. They're similar to a ghost, but you can't see through them, and they don't seem to react or respond to any kind of stimulation of any kind, because I threw a chunk of wood at it, and it just kept going. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, in your research, Brandon, have you seen a, a difference between shadow people and, and ghostly entities? I mean, I know that certainly shadow people have kind of overtaken the, the paranormal world in the last few years. Yeah, I've noticed that, yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, it's it's hard to tell. Um, a lot of the a lot of the cases that people told me, there wasn't a lot of shadow stuff involved. It was actually pretty intense visual apparitions or smells or auditory or things like that. You know, shadow people, um, it it, it kind of crosses the line between ghosts and sleep paralysis. Um, I I suffered from sleep paralysis for a number of years, and um, with sleep paralysis, is you basically wake up in the middle of the night and you can't move your body, but um, you usually see shadows coming at you, but you can't talk or move or anything like that, and it's usually shadows. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if there really is a difference between the two. Um, I don't know enough about all these shadow men and shadow people and things like that. I would say there's probably not. I would say probably shadow people are probably just, residual hauntings of some kind that, that um, you know, we're just not making out. Um, it's not, it, the, the signal isn't strong enough for it to be hugely visual. Uh, but that's a great question. You know, I, 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 like you said, it's becoming more and more popular, and I'm, I'm probably five years behind <laughs> what's popular. So I'll probably read about this and start researching a little bit more about the shadow stuff. I mean, I can I can offer a little bit of insight from from my own experiences is I think part of the reason why we might there's OK. So there's different schools of thought, as you mentioned, as to what a shadow person might might be. Some people feel it's a it's a non-human entity. Some people feel it is, uh, you know, like a residual haunt that is just not fully strong enough to form. Uh, some people feel like it's an apparition that hasn't quite fully formed itself, but it is intelligent. I can tell you that I have experienced three-dimensional shadow people that have uh, walked between myself and somebody else standing across from each other. We've had a parade of shadow people walk right between us. I have had a shadow person grab my hand and shake it. Uh, you know, I've had some pretty profound experiences with shadow people that I think that there's there's something to it. And I think the reason why we're seeing more of them is because they were kind of always around, but now we're paying more attention to them. So they are these lower energetic beings, but at the same time, they're, they still have an intelligence and a mindset to them. So to me, you know, that means it could be a wide variety of things. Could it be that we're just reaching into another dimension that we can't see into? Is this another plane of existence that we just, you know, we're, we're able to perceive slightly but not fully? Uh, I honestly think that shadow people are more likely than not not a ghost, not the spirit of a dead person somehow manifesting as a shadow. I think it's something else 
completely. And I think it's something that has always been around us. That's my own belief, but as I encounter them more and more, I'm not seeing anything that, that makes me think otherwise. But if, if, if the shadow, if, if it's like a, another dimension type thing, you, you, you mentioned like tactile, you felt like it touched you or grabbed you. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, okay. It, so, it, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not afraid to admit I, I cried when it happened because I had been one of those people that goes into haunted places and, you know, yells and says, where are you? Come out here. I want to see you, you know. And, yeah. and this was the moment where I said, okay, maybe what I'm dealing with is something that has an intelligence and, and a feeling like I do, and, and maybe I should be a little bit more respectful to it. Okay. I know yeah, it's, I have it's, to look. I have to look more into that. I... It's, it's hard to it's, – it's, it's hard to believe – uh, in, until it happens to you, and, and I oh, always, yeah, yeah. I always thought shadow people could be easily explained by every time I'd seen them on television. I'm like, there's probably a reflection or, you know, yeah. something that's happening here that makes people think that there's this shadow. Until I started, uh, you know, encountering them, and now I encounter them frequently, frequently enough that I'm starting to think that it's something that's just always around us that we're just not perceiving. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I, uh, I, I'm not. You know, I was a pretty ardent skeptic for a long por portion of my life, and I've I've mentioned this on other when I'm doing talking, speaking engagements. But you know, I was really an ardent skeptic for a long period of time. I was on the skeptical blogs. Um, I never had a paranormal experience, so I was really hesitant to believe people who did. Um, and and I found that once I I stopped trying to explain these things, and I just started listening to people's experiences, and um, you know, just taking in these subjective ghostly encounters, that's when you really start understanding the phenomenon better than maybe re reading just research articles or skeptical blogs or ways to um, debunk things. Because you get so focused on ways to prove somebody's lying that you miss the actual experience that's such a awe-inspiring, uh, fantastic, you know, mind-melting experience that's going on. Uh, and so I, stepping away from that and, you know, like you said, experiencing things or listening to things and being open to things, I think moves people uh, more towards understanding these ghostly encounters. I mean, I, I can tell you that I've, I've done a lot of events, uh, a lot of investigations with Jeff Belanger, and, and Jeff has a, a saying, uh, you know, that he, a story that he tells every time that we have an event and we're telling people to be aware of their surroundings, he talks about the people who he's seen with his own eyes are walking around with their faces buried in some kind of a device, you know, staring at some sort of a screen or some sort of a piece of handheld equipment while activity is happening right in front of their face, but because they're not registering anything on that device in front of them, they're not even paying attention to what's happening, you know, two feet away. And yeah. that's that's the key to this whole thing is the experience part of it. Yeah, and 90, 99% of the, the ghostly encounters that, that people have told me, they're usually by themselves, usually in a calm environment, um, whether that's just kind of sitting in a room looking at a computer um, or, or sitting in a room reading a book or getting ready to go to bed, something like that. So they're almost in a meditative state. You know, you don't have ghostly encounters when people are in clubs or at football games. Or, you know what I'm saying? So usually when you're, you're, you're sort of not really focused but sort of meditative, relaxed, comfortable, um, usually alone, that's when these paranormal experiences tend to happen. If you're buried and you got meters beeping and screaming and ghost box going, da 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 you, you, you really are hindering yourself from having an experience. Yeah, that, it, it's the need to quantify it should not override the need to experience it. And that's where people are short selling themselves. If, if they are going to these places and putting themselves into that moment, then you have to realize that it's... It's not gonna. It's it's not gonna happen because you want to record it. It's not gonna happen because you want to take a photo or a video of it. It's gonna happen because you want to interact with it or it wants to interact with you, and that is like replay hauntings, residual hauntings. They don't get me excited anymore. You know, the, to me, I've accepted that that happens and that that's there. I want to have an intelligent two-way interaction so I can try to figure out what this is and why it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, the, I know that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. You mentioned in the book that you don't actually uh, go uh, on hundreds of investigations, but you've been on some. So you've, oh, yeah. you've experienced yeah. this yourself. Uh, when when you go, what's kind of your what's kind of your standard operating procedure when you go into a place? Well, a lot of times, um, a lot of times, teams will invite me, um, and I'll kind of go hang out with them, uh, and I kind of watch what they do. Um, but my own my own perspective, uh, I like to go into some place. Uh, usually, I'll go in and do baseline readings of all the rooms. And, and kind of get a baseline EMF. Um, I usually always have an EMF somewhere near me um, to note if, it, if it's erratic or different from the baseline readings. But a majority of the time, I'm just sort of by myself. You know, obviously I'll have a flashlight or something like that. But, but that's really my operating procedure. If I'm not doing like some sort of research where I have to collect data or questionnaires from people, it, that aside, if it's just me doing it, then I'll just have an e an one EMF meter, and I'll just experience for what it is. Um, you know, just sitting in a room by myself, dark, um, sort of just taking it in. Um, that's really how I see it as being, uh, if you're looking for an experience, that's really where you want to be. You know, documenting it, doing things like that, I, I think that's another conversation to have. But... Um, you know how to how to document and get concrete data um, is more of a, a longitudinal or long term thing rather than a got it right away. I think there has to be a little bit more preparation for that. I mean, we've we've had profound things happen on on events that the next day I have to go on social media and say to the people that were there, "Hey, does anybody have you know video of that?" Because I'm just not thinking to take myself out of the moment and, and document it. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm so much wrapped up in what's happening that I don't even worry because what am I going to show somebody later on? I'm going to show them a video of what happened and they're going to say, oh, yeah, the, the lights went on. That's that's cool, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the problem. I, You know, and I feel bad sometimes for a lot of these teams. You put all this time and effort and then, you know, you put this EVP or something out into the world and then what happens after that? few people listen to it you get a couple likes and then it's gone you know there's the, the, the problem a lot of times with paranormal research in the paranormal field is if everyone got together and they got a standardized questionnaire they got standardized protocol um, you could really and you did statistics on all the variables that you collected you could really come up with a lot of possibly consistent data um, but now everyone just does their own thing, and it's all random, and it's all over the place that you really can't have any sort of consistency to it. So this, this EVP or this video is just sort of lost in the, in the web, um, and it's just background noise. But, you know, if academia would really listen if we had 300,000 questionnaires completed by people who had paranormal experiences. That's the kind of data that academia would salivate for. I did my research, and I had 251 participants come through my haunted location with a questionnaire. That's a huge sample size in psychology. You get 300,000 people completing questionnaires on paranormal experiences that standardize. Academia will take notice of that, I think, and then you can probably get some sort of research out of that. Well, what's funny is, you know, there's been numerous efforts over the years, uh, you know, in the, uh, the amount of years we've been doing this show, there's been at least two or three major undertakings that I'm aware of, of people that try to create a, a database of reports that tried to create a worldwide standardized procedure for investigations. There's been all these organizations that have come and gone because they realize that they just can't get everybody to figure out how to do this. And, and I'm, I try to explain to the people that start it, you're, you have the right intentions, but it's never going to happen. It would basically be like saying, uh, you know, here is the standard operating procedure for fixing your motorcycle. Here's how you're going to do it. It's always going to be done this way. And that's the, the way that it has to be done for everybody to accept it. But then you've got all these, you know, backyard mechanics that are going to say, yeah, yeah, but I do it this way and it still gets the job done. And so that's what we're dealing with with investigators is that we have a lot of people that aren't tied to 
the scientific method already. So they're not used to having to follow those those types of procedures. So we're never going to be able to kind of pinpoint it down where all of these reports that come in can all be uh, acquired in a, in, a, in a sanitary and, and widely accepted way. And I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's how it's been for the last 10, 15 years. And, and what you're going to get is what what's going on in the paranormal field. It's stalled. There's no progress. Um, it's it's not considered legitimate to a lot of people. Um, that's what's going to happen unless you have standardized stuff, protocols and, and everything going on. I mean, unfortunately, you know, it, it, that's just the way it's going to be. And that's, that's okay. And it's, that's not a negative thing in a way, if you want to think about it. If you're, if, you're, um, if you're out just to prove things for yourself or get experiences for yourself, then that's okay. But if, if, as a field, you want to move it forward. I, there's, like you said, there's got to be a lot of changes to it. You can't have the backyard kick a door open, throw a ghost box in, and um, you know, run around instigating or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It, it, there's, there's got to be something to it. Um, and, you know, it's it's boring when when you take something as cool as ghost hunting and you and you turn it into structured questionnaires. <laughs> well, that's that's the thing is you're taking a, a moment of adrenaline because that's what a lot of what we're dealing with is. Uh, you know, as much as people want to say that they're into this for the answers and, and, and for the research, you're also into it because you like that moment, that aha moment, that, that moment of adrenaline when it actually happens. And, and as you write about in the book, you know, the adrenaline is part of, part of the process. It's part of what's going on. But yeah. – that's what I think a lot of people get into it for. And the more you bog it down with process, then it takes away that the, it takes away the allure yeah. of that adrenaline rush. It does. It does. And, and, and that's fine. You know, it's, I, I think there, there's a subset of the, the field that probably wants to move it forward in that way. And there's a subset that doesn't. Um, but, you know, does, does one dictate the other? I, I don't know. I, I, I've been sort of on the outline of the paranormal for a while because I've, you know, been doing the, the uh, academia part of things, and, and now I'm sort of more enmeshed in it since the book came out because I'm at these conferences, I'm getting invited by these teams to go places. So th the more I'm into it, the more I sort of not only see the benefits, but I also see some things that can improve. And and one of the things that could really help is is a lot more skepticism, but not an overabundance of it and certainly not cynicism, but skeptics yeah. do play a role in, in what it is that we do. There, there has to be some accountability for what it is that we're, we are trying to present to the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and that's true in, in any, in any field. And, you know, you're going to, you put a research article out there, you're going to have people to tell you what you can do differently or to improve it. Um, how you take that criticism or suggestions or <laughs> Is, is up to you, um, but yeah, skeptics would play a huge role in things. I, I feel too that the the other issue is overwhelmingly, uh, you know, people are still afraid to talk about their experiences. They're still afraid to share them because of the stigma. We people who are into this topic like to think that it's more mainstream than it's ever been, and and. That's certainly debatable. I mean, you can go back to the era of spiritualism when it was probably far more accepted to talk about ghosts than it is now. But we like to think in terms of at least our modern existence. You know, we're at a time when people are at their most comfortable sharing this stuff because of its proliferation in the media. But yeah. people are still afraid that there's that correlation of, you know, they always start off explaining an experience with, you're going to think I'm crazy, but... And you're somebody that actually has a background in knowing if somebody is, pardon the expression, crazy, but you're able to kind of separate that, uh, the idea between mental illness and experience. And, and I feel yeah. like that's a lot of what's missing from, from the research that people are doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the, in, I mean, you know, in the book, I have a whole chapter on not everything is paranormal. And one of the things in there is, you know, mental illness versus experience. Um, it, it is, it's, uh, now if we look at how it was 30, 40 year, years ago, it's probably, you're looked at less crazy if you have a paranormal experience than men. But, you know, I, I know that 
even go in, in work and in family situations, um, when someone talks about having a ghostly encounter, it's, um, you know, sometimes there can be some, oh, dude, what do you think about Susie's experience? That was kind of weird, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you sort of still get that type of thing in the environment, in, in the world. Um, I mean, until, you know, my family never really talked about ghosts. Uh, I put this book out, and then as soon as the book got out, literally the, the first, I gave one of my first prints to my grandma, and then she's telling me an experience of telepathy. I'm like, where has this been for 94 years? You never mentioned this <laughs> right. before. <laughs> now all of a sudden, because I wrote a book about it, everyone wants to tell me about it. So they feel comfortable with me. Um, so, yeah, there's still, it's still uncomfortable. There's still a stigma associated with it. I, I used to go to a, 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 a psychologist myself, and, you know, when I started doing this show and, and getting involved into with these kind of topics, and we quickly went from talking about me and my problems to him presenting me a bunch of, you know, think, stories that other people had told him and experiences that he had had. And at first I started to think, this is just some sort of way, like some sort of reverse psychology to kind of get me to, to think about myself and my own issues. And then I just realized, no, he's basically just using me as a, as a, as a, you know, a sounding board to, to share these experiences and tell them what they could be or couldn't be to tell other people, and, which yeah. made me very uncomfortable, but <laughs> I could imagine, but I, you're paying them too, right? <laughs> right. But then I, well, the insurance company was, so thankfully oh, yeah. it was, I was only had a $20 copay, but uh, oh, I was, right. I was glad that, you know, that people were opening up to him about these experiences enough that he was hearing about them. So, it, you know, it, people were talking about them in a way where they were saying, I want to make sure that this is a healthy thing that's happening to me. So at least they were able to self-censor instead of running right to the idea of ghost uh, immediately. And, and that's actually, just real quick, that, that's actually, um, there's a thing called clinical parapsychology, which is um, probably in the last, I don't know, five years or so, where there's actually people who are sort of trained um, in, in both clinical psychology and like, parapsychology. Because there's a lot of people who have these distressing events, and they don't really know what to do with it. So there's the clinical parapsychology is sort of how to manage people who have paranormal phenomena, how to help them cope, uh, deal with emotions, uh, normalize the situation so they don't feel like they're going um, crazy. So that's actually, that you mentioned that, that's something that's happened in the last five years or so. Well, I'm, I'm glad that that is the case, uh, and I'm glad that the book is doing well. It's called The Ghost Studies, New Perspectives on the Origins of Paranormal Experiences. Uh, so now is there is there going to be a follow-up with, you know, going out to these conventions and talking with other people that are in the field? Is this something you're going to continue on with? Yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been great this, this past year. I've, I've met so many people at these uh, the paranormal conventions and the speaking engagements that, you know, I've gotten about two or three new ideas for new books that I'm um, sort of working on right now unfortunately it takes me a while to write books because i got a full-time job and i get lazy on the weekends but um hopefully i'll be getting something new in the future excellent excellent well definitely keep us up to date with everything uh again brandon masulo his website is hauntedtheories.com you can follow him on twitter uh, at haunted theories uh, you can find him on facebook haunted theories there's also although is there an extra s in haunted theories on facebook I think there might be. I think you're right. All right, because I, I saw it with an extra, so I just want to make sure so the people are, yeah. are finding it correctly. And, of course, you can get the book uh, on Amazon. Again, it's called The Ghost Studies, New Perspectives on the Origins of Paranormal Experiences. Uh, Brandon Masulo, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for uh, giving us some alternate theories, and we look forward to talking with you more in the future. Thanks, Tim. It was, it was real fun. And I'll, I'll keep an eye out for your, uh, your review of Haunted Towns as well. <laughs> Oh, you, oh, that's one you wrote as well? Yeah, that's me too. So, Oh, that's on my radar now. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great night. You too. Take care. Uh, again, Brandon Masulo, hauntedtheories.com is his website if you want to check it out for yourself. Hey, Matt, uh, our buddy Ross has a show coming up we want to let everybody know about. Do you, do you have the details on that? Uh, I can bring that up. All right. Well, second. while you're doing that. I know it's called the May Banger, and it's, called, and it's in uh, Syracuse, New York. Syracuse, New York. He gets around. So uh, we had them on a few weeks ago talking about uh, paranormal, a few months ago, talking about paranormal stories in rock and roll. Uh, so you can uh, you can check out that previous episode. While Matt's looking that up, I just want to let everybody know about Parabox Monthly. They have silkscreen soft style t-shirts 
that are super comfortable, that actually have puzzles built into them. Codes, ciphers, riddles, numbers, images, other hidden gems. So you can actually explore the design and put the pieces together to figure out where to go next. And you can get these from Parabox Monthly on a month-to-month plan, a three-month plan, or a six-month plan. No contracts. You can cancel any time. And if you sign up now, you can do so using our code SPOOKYLIVE and get 10% off. Ghosts and haunted locations, UFO encounters and aliens, folklore and legends, cryptozoology, urban legends, all available from Parabox Monthly. Just go to paraboxmonthly.com, use the promo code SPOOKYLIVE, save 10%. And Matt, do you, do you have the details I on do, that? I do, I uh, do. May 16th, uh, it's called the May Banger. It's going to be at the Spark Contemporary Art Space. Uh, it's um, 10.05 East, uh, East Fayette Street in Syracuse, New York. Um, st- show starts at 7 o'clock. It's a, it's a heavy metal show, so anybody in the area of Syracuse wants to go out and check it out. Um, I believe uh, Ross Ross is playing with his band and some some other like really uh, great bands of the area. All right. So, well, you can, we'll share that out on Facebook, too, so that everybody can catch it on the yeah, Spooky South Coast Facebook. So just look us up. Spooky South Coast on Facebook, Spooky SC on Twitter. We are all over the place. Find us, follow us. Until next week, stay spooktacular. Oh!